Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Robert. My name is David. My name is Richard. <coughs> I'm Michael. Dennis. Wally. My name is Mark. Chris. Al. I'm Tom Drew. <coughs> Nathan. I'm Jerry Martin. My name is Brian. I'm Richard Azzolini. <coughs> I'm Drew Castro Vipsy. I'm George. I'm John. I'm Jack. My name is Cass. My name is John. My name is Roy. My name is John. My name is Jerry Jones. Okay. Michael. Call me up. Captain, everybody. I guess so. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, once again uh, Larry Robinson. He's been uh, with us several times in the past. Uh, uh, Larry is, uh, has been a practicing meditation since 1969. Uh, he's a student of both the Zen tradition and the Diamond Sangha lineage with John Tarrant, and the Vipassana tradition through uh, Spirit Rock. Uh, he's a re retired psychopath, a psychotherapist whose works uh, focus uh, primarily in eco-psychology. Larry has served in the Sebastopol City Council since uh, 1998 and just ended uh, uh, a little while ago, uh, including uh, two terms as mayor of Sebastopol. Uh, uh, Larry's passion is the restoration of the oral tradition of poetry. So welcome, Larry. Thank you. Thank you all for inviting me to be with you this morning. It's always a pleasure and a um, deep gift to sit with with people like you. You do not have to be good. These are the words of Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I'll tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscape, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. <coughs> so Mary's words point at what I want to talk about this morning with you, which is freedom and happiness. <clears throat> I think that there are some seriously misleading understandings and ideas of what freedom is in our society and what leads to happiness. 
probably the most common understanding of freedom and the most deluded is the idea that freedom means to be able to do whatever you feel like. When you really think about it, doing whatever you feel like is another name for addiction, isn't it? Which may be the greatest tyranny there is. More than somebody else or something else controlling us, an inner compulsion unexamined that runs our lives is the greatest tyranny. Freedom is really about expressing our true nature. And this is where happiness comes in. Happiness, we are taught to believe in our consumerist culture that happiness is something that can be attained or achieved if we can only have that, whatever it is out there. A certain lifestyle, a certain partner or lover, a certain status in society, a certain amount of money. Um, you know, if we are just healthy enough or we floss our teeth or we exercise <coughs> enough or whatever it is, something out there we're taught is what leads to happiness. You know, I was recently in um, a little country in the Himalayas called Bhutan. It's one of the few remaining Himalayan um, Buddhist kingdoms. And there they are engaged in a very interesting project. They call it the Gross Domestic Happiness Project. And this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek but also very serious uh, contrast to how in the West we measure our quality of life, which is by gross domestic product. In other words, how much of the world's resources we're able to consume is our standard for how we're doing as a people. In Bhutan, they saw a generation ago that they were coming into relationship with the, with the outside world, whether they wanted it or not. And they saw television was coming, roads were coming, uh, consumer products were coming. And the question was not whether we keep it out or not, but how we can hold what's coming our way in a way that doesn't destroy the basis of our culture. So the previous king decreed that they would measure their progress toward development by a new standard called gross domestic happiness, which is it's a whole um, series of indices, but it's factors like um, educational level, protection of the environment, protection of the local indigenous culture, access to health care, um, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, those kinds of things. But they also understood that these things did not cause happiness. They were the pillars of happiness, but not the cause of it. And there, they practice Vajrayana Buddhism, like they do in Tibet. Um, and the understanding there is that happiness is something that is inherent in our very existence. What, what we call in the Buddhist tradition bodhicitta, the Buddha mind, the awakened mind. And that without the conditions for the pillars of happiness, it's hard to do the work, it's hard to do the practices that will facilitate the realization of freedom and happiness. You know, if you're struggling just to keep a roof over your head, if you're dealing with poverty on a day-to-day -day basis or political repression or living in a degraded environment, it's very hard to focus your efforts on the practice. 
but they understand that it is the practice that leads to the realization of freedom and happiness. And we are so blessed in our culture. Look at all of us here on a Sunday morning. We have the gift of the leisure of being able to sit together, to deepen our practice, to share this this depth of experience. It's a rare thing. It's said that once in a hundred thousand births does one have the opportunity to take birth in a human body. And it's only once in every 10,000 human incarnations that one has the opportunity to hear the Dharma. And it's once in every thousand of those incarnations that one has the opportunity to find a Sangha. So we are blessed, we are truly gifted to be able to hear the Dharma, to practice it, and to practice it together. In the Vajrayana tradition of Buddhism, they also say that we are born again and again in a state of delusion because of three factors, greed, hatred, and ignorance. And these are all based in a misunderstanding of our, of our true nature. Existence itself consists of four characteristics. One is impermanence, another is no self, and then third is dukkha, or suffering. By impermanence, what we mean is that there is nothing that exists in itself and nothing that is not in constant flux. And when you really meditate on this profoundly, you understand what a great blessing this is. Our unconditioned, our conditioned mind wants to hold on to things and make them permanent and solid. But holding on to what is not permanent is the very root of our suffering. as is believing in the existence of a separate self. If we believe that we are real, then there is something for us to defend. And as we defend our opinions about who we are against other people's opinions of who we are or who we think we ought to be, we build the illusion of solidity which is always slipping away from us. And the more we try to hold on to that, the more we are grasping for something permanent in ourselves or in the world around us, the more suffering we create for ourselves and for those around us. Freedom is our natural state. But it doesn't come, the realization of our freedom doesn't come without the practice that we do here when we sit. The sitting and whether you're working with a mantra or with your breath or with a koan, or just your posture, whatever your practice is on the cushion, this is practice for the real practice, which comes when we get up from our cushion and go to our place of work, 
or get in our car and get in traffic and our reactions immediately arise to somebody is doing something that threatens my sense of who I am or where I ought to be or how I ought to be able to be in the world and our reactions of, of anger or resentment or grasping arise and we lose our equanimity. So the practice of the practice really comes when we get up from our cushion and go out there in the world and we remember as that driver is cutting us off we're noticing our reaction of rage and just in the noticing of that is a moment of enlightenment that's where our freedom is freedom is not in acting out our impulse to blow the horn or give that guy a finger but to notice our reaction and choose not to act it out <clears throat> the four great wisdom practices in the Buddhist tradition the paramitas they're called are which, which as we practice them out there and in here lead to the realization of freedom are Loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And the loving kindness practice is really the practice of blessing. And blessing is something that comes to you through doing. As we bless our world and our fellow pilgrims in this world, we are blessed in the process. In the words of John O'Donohue, on the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets in you, may there come a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azure blue to awaken in you a meadow of delight. And when the canvas frays on the kurak of thought and the stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the water a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of the light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. So as I say these words to you, there is a blessing that's coming through me, not from me, but through me to you and beyond to wherever you choose to continue that flow. But as I deliver it, I feel my heart softening, my heart opening, and that is the blessing for me. The practice of loving kindness is to bestow blessings. And in this, its simplest form, the practice is be, usually, traditionally, begins with myself. May I be happy May I be free from fear and danger. May I be at peace. <clears throat> May my friends and loved ones be happy. May they be free from fear and danger. May they be at peace. And then we take it a little bit further. 
to those people we have some trouble with, maybe even our enemies. May my enemies be happy. May they be free from fear and danger. May my enemies be at peace. And that's a difficult one to practice. And when we first start out doing that, we don't really believe it. We may want to. But in the wanting to and in the struggle, in the struggle to offer that blessing to those people that we don't want to offer it to, our, the muscles of our heart begin to relax and soften. And we find all of our resistance coming up and we get the opportunity to examine our own resistance and become friends with that and soften around that. And eventually, you really are able to bless those people that are enemies. You know, for years, I used to keep Dick Cheney on my altar <clears throat> and offer him that blessing every morning. May he be happy, may he be free of suffering, may he be at peace. Rick Santorum is a wonderful um, <clears throat> person I would encourage everyone to add to their, um, to their meta practice, the loving kindness practice. Who needs it more than someone whose heart is so shut down? And it's not about changing them, but it's about opening our own hearts. And finally, we can extend that practice to all beings, human, animal, gods, and demigods, those born and those yet to be born. May we all be happy. We, may we all be free from fear and danger and suffering. May we all be at peace. And in doing this, we and our world become a little softer and a little gentler. This is the practice of loving kindness. And the practice of compassion is the recognition of our shared suffering. The recognition that whatever depths of sorrow you've known, there is no one else who has also not known similar suffering. If we truly knew the depths of someone else's suffering, we would not be able to judge or hate anyone. Naomi Shihab Nye says, Before you can know the true meaning of kindness, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all that must go so you know how great the desolate landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken, will stare out the window forever. Before you can know the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with the plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you can know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak with it until your tongue grips the thread of all sorrow and you see the full size of the cloth then you know it is only kindness that means anything anymore. Only kindness that lifts its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for all your life. 
and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. You know, someone once asked the Dalai Lama about his religion. What, what is your religion? They asked him. He said, it's one word, it's kindness. When you know that we are of one substance, one spirit, like Mary Oliver says in her poem, Wild Geese, knowing our part in the family of things, our place in the family of things, how can you not feel the suffering of everybody else and want to do something about it to ease that suffering because that suffering is our suffering it's not your suffering and my suffering this is not a zero sum game that we're in if we can reduce the suffering of one person we're reducing the suffering of everyone including ourselves. And one of the most important ways to reduce suffering is to bring joy into the world. The third of the paramitas of the great wisdom is to cultivate joy. And we can do that through music, through poetry, through art, through just experiencing the beauty of this world and the beauty of each other. David Budbill says, Han Shan, that great and crazy Chinese poet a thousand years ago, said, we're all like bugs in a bowl. I say, that's right. Every day, climbing up the side, sliding back down over and over again. So, sit in the bottom of the bowl head in your hands, moan, cry, feel sorry for yourself. Or walk around, greet your fellow bugs, say, hey, how are you doing? Say, nice bowl. (laughs) You know, if we can just greet our fellow bugs and appreciate this nice bowl and share that joy, we are easing the suffering of all beings. And the fourth paramita is equanimity. That means a balanced spirit, not getting caught up in these contradictions that we often feel we have to choose between good and bad, between pleasure and pain, between fame and disgrace, between approval or disapproval. You know, those false choices are what catch us up in hatred, greed, and delusion. So cultivating equanimity in the face of the challenging times which we're certainly in these days, aren't we? And this seems to be accelerating. So here's here's a little bit of a recipe for equanimity. Let go of fear and rest in that which is. For peace, like love, comes to those who allow it. Watch the breath rise and fall. Watch the tides rise and fall. Watch towers rise and fall. Watch walls rise and fall. Watch empires rise and fall. Watch the breath rise and fall. Let go of fear and rest in the arms of the one who has always held you. 
the one who holds oceans and empires and atoms and stars. Let go of fear and watch what happens next. So having some perspective on the flow of events in our own lives can help us remember our equanimity, which is part of our natural inheritance too. In Buddhism they talk about the three treasures the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And when you take vows in any Buddhist order, you take refuge. Beautiful word, beautiful concept. You take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And that means to me letting go of this belief in myself that I have to protect and defend and continually reconstruct and surrendering to the awakening mind. This is really what Buddha means. It's not some historical personage or some celestial being that's going to come down with rays of light and and save us. No, it's the awakening mind that is our very nature. And if we can let ourselves be held by that, by that awakening mind, then there is nothing to fear. And taking refuge in the Dharma can be interpreted as taking refuge in the teachings and in the, in the traditions and the wisdom of Buddhism. But another older, deeper meaning for Dharma is the nature of things, or things as they are. And to me, this is where I find the greatest comfort is in the surrender to what is, letting go of the resistance to the changing flow of existence and holding it with a sense of curiosity. What will happen next? We all have our ideas of what will happen next, but truly we don't know when we think we have it figured out, life will surprise us. It may surprise us with some wonderful person we're going to meet when we step out the door. It could surprise us with a medical diagnosis we had no idea was coming. When we think we know, we are trying to shape reality to fit our pictures. So if we can cultivate a sense of friendly curiosity, both toward the world and toward what may arise within us in response to that, we find the gateway to our freedom. And the third treasure, the Sangha, is the community, on one level, it's the community of fellow practitioners on the path. But it's also the whole community of beings, awakened and unawakened, human, animal, gods, rocks and trees, all of us, are part of that family of things that Mary Oliver speaks of.
Gary Snyder, um, wonderful Buddhist teacher and poet, has this poem that he titles For the Children that I think I'll probably end with. He says, The rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up as we all go down. In the next century, or the one beyond that, they say, are valleys, pastures. We can meet there in peace, if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children. Stay together. Learn the flowers. Go light. Thank you very much for your time and attention. So if we have time, I don't know if we do. So we definitely have plenty of time, so we can have a Open to questions, comments, questions. reflections. Yes. Well, I have a question for you. Uh, since you have the experience of being a mayor, uh, I imagine you're accustomed to deal with people who feel very impassioned about issues and difficult issues and <coughs> uh, conflicts. Yes. How do you keep your equanimity in, in a role like that? Uh, with great difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> but it's when it's when the practice is difficult is when we make the most progress, isn't it? So, um, two practices that were very helpful for me in that, um, when someone would come to the podium to denounce me or the council or for whatever, um, the practice of loving kindness, of metta, was a lifesaver for me. May you be happy. May you be free from danger and fear. May you be at peace. So I would pay as deep attention as I could to what was motivating their aggression. And generally it's fear. You know, because they're afraid that they're not going to be hurt or they're not going to get what they want. So they're coming at you with full force by not resisting it but by opening my heart to them I would find in almost all cases their, their anger would, would dissipate as they felt heard not all cases but um, that helped by, by not resisting um, I didn't create more anger and hatred in myself. Um, in the Himalayan Buddhist traditions, you often see images of um, wrathful deities. And these were originally demons that um, Padmasambhava, who was the uh, enlightened being who brought Buddhism to the Himalayas, converted. Um, and the way he converted them was by finding what their gift was and enlisting them in the service of the Dharma by giving them enough of what they really needed that they no longer needed to be enemies. Um, and one of, the, one of the practices in Tibetan Buddhism is called uh, chud, which involves um, imagining the demons that are attacking you, whether they're outside or inside. And you invite them to a feast and the feast is you cut off your own head, which is essentially about letting go of your 
belief in your own specialness, turning that upside down into a cauldron, chopping your body into little pieces, putting it in there, making a soup. You cook the soup down and then you invite the demons to come and eat until they are full and satisfied. And then you ask them, what gifts do you bring? And then they serve you. So that's where they serve the Dharma. <laughs> there is another practice, um, also based in the Vajrayana tradition, um, called Tonglen, which is almost the opposite of the uh, kind of New Age um, meditation of breathing in the light and breathing out the darkness. In Tonglen, you breathe in the anger that's coming your way and you transmute it and you breathe out love. You breathe in the rage and you breathe out forgiveness. Breathe in fear, breathe out peace. That's those those practices um, were lifesavers to me in um, in my political work. I'm not by nature um, an extrovert. You know, I've, I've learned to talk to groups, but it was very, very painful and difficult for me. So my, my practice um, was my, uh, my <clears throat> refuge as I learned to do that. So thank you for that question. What else? Yes, Tom. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you, thank you so much for coming back. And um, I feel we've done a disservice by just describing you as someone who recites poetry. <laughs> um, you, you've taken, you know, you pull wisdom from the poems and weave it together, and, and um, this is one of the most lucid and, and succinct Dharma talks I've heard. It's wonderful. So, oh, thank, thank you. you. How does, um, what do you feel is is the key or a good way to stay mindful of these, you know, these things that you talk about of understanding reality and who we are and what we're not, and on a day to day, moment to moment. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we stay that way? Um, we, of course, we're going to follow <coughs> the path, but what do you think is best for bringing yourself back to that moment to moment? Well, you hit the, the nail on the head there. We don't stay in that. We always, we lose it continually, and we remember it. It's in the remembering of it that we have that moment of enlightenment. So practicing on the cushion the recalling as, you know, we're counting our breaths, for instance, or whatever our practice is, our mind will just drift off into, oh, I'm, what I'm going to do for lunch, or I should have done this, oh, I've got, I've got to take care of it, you know. Whatever, we're all familiar with all those things that the mind does. That is the nature of the mind, and that's its job. We don't stop it. But what we do as we sit on the cushion is... When we do remember that we're doing it, we notice, ah, thinking, or planning, or emotions, or sensation. It's just in that moment that we, that we call it back and we wake up again. So as we sit on the cushion, we strengthen that, um, the recall muscle. And the more we do that, the more uh, likely we are to um, have that available to us when we're living our daily lives, when we're actually in the crucible of, of interactions. Is that? Yeah, so are you saying that meditation, having a meditation, regular meditation practice is vital to the remembering muscle? I would say it's absolutely vital. Um <clears throat> You know, even if you're only sitting 10 or 15 minutes a day, that makes a huge difference in your ability to um, be mindful during the rest of the day. And over time, it does, it does get stronger. And you can, you know, put up post-it notes for yourself in your mirror or in your car. 
um, to remind yourself. Um, but really, it, it is just about the practice of remembering to be awake. And this is the gift of impermanence and of suffering, because when we notice that we're suffering, if we have just an occasional experience of that awakening on the cushion, when the suffering arises in our lives, the remembrance, the memory of the awakening will also arise with it. That's, that's the gift. Thank you for uh, the talk that reminds me how challenging practice can be. So, um, yeah. like Rick St. Tauron, for instance, I, I try to think of him in terms of him being the white poncho Indian by the side of the road. Uh-huh. Um, but I feel um, in doing that, there's it, it feels like a form of um, just acceptance of who he is and, and what he is, and mm. and so on the other hand, I feel there's the <clears throat> evil flourishes when good people do nothing, and so is there a way to undermine everything he stands for with, in a loving way? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> Well, in the Christian tradition, they say, love the sinner, but not the sin. Okay. We can have compassion for the damaged soul that is acting out in the way that he's acting out, but that does not in any way excuse his behavior, and it does not in any way relieve us of the responsibility of challenging um, injustice and intolerance and hatred and evil. I think, I think we have a responsibility to speak out against that and refuse to accept it. Um, the challenge is not to hate him as we're doing it. And it's hard because you know, it comes up in us, and then we have to love the part of ourselves that wants to hate, <laughs> which is not the same as giving it permission to act out. We're really using the same <clears throat> loving kindness towards our own um, impulses that, that separate us as we're using towards those people who are separating. Does that, does that help? Yes. Um, with um, all of these, sometimes with practice and um, uh, the nature of suffering and, and life, and it can tend to get very heavy and very difficult. Um, thank you for mentioning, mentioning the importance of cultivating joy. Um, and I'd like to know if you could speak a little more of that importance and how that fits in. Mm. <coughs> Thank you. Well, let me offer one poem that will <laughs> kind of <clears throat> Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives might be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still waters and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. The natural world is one of the places where I go to recover my joy. Um, And attentiveness, 
I mean, there is so much that is broken in our world that it, we can focus on that. And I think we are called to repair what's broken, but we're also called to remember the beauty and the wonder of this world. Um, if you can find a place at night where there's not a lot of ambient light and look at the stars, my God, what an amazing thing that is. And just how rare this beautiful blue pearl we're, we're spinning on is in all of this vast existence. And then bring our focus down to the blades of grass and all the life under the soil, how the ants and the moles and uh, gophers are constantly turning this over and how utterly dependent our food supply is on on the billions and trillions of ants. I mean, I mean, I can go on and on when I think about the inner, the interplay of all life and what an absolute miracle it is. And I don't believe anybody designed it or created it, but it's something. It is self. Um, it's an open life. Is an, evolution is an open source movement. It's it's just unfolding on its own. And we don't know where it's going. But just to pay attention to a few inches of grass will remind you of that. And let your mind expand with the wonder of the interconnectedness of all. How can you not feel joy? And to open your throat and sing. Um, <clears throat> even if you think you can't sing. Um, <laughs> let your voice find some song that is yours. Because we each do have a song to sing. We each do have a gift that we have come here to deliver. And it can be depressing and lonely to be wandering for years trying to deliver that gift and not find the place where it belongs. So much so that we can forget that the gift we're carrying really is precious and really does belong somewhere to the point that we begin to devalue it and not appreciate it. But the reality is we have all come here to deliver a precious gift. And it may be our pain, our own particular suffering that is the gift that someone else needs to hear that is their medicine. So telling the story of your pain may be the gift that the world needs for its for its completion. Another way to cultivate joy is to look around at your fellow bugs <laughs> and truly wonder at the miracle of this man's life. How has he gotten here? How is it that he has come through so much to be here to be able to look me in the eye see another me. Well, thanks so much, Larry. And uh, we're, uh, we're going to be hanging around okay. you know, for half an hour, so if you're willing to hang around for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to have to say goodbye pretty quickly because I'm meeting some friends for lunch. But um, I'll be happy to hang out for a little bit if anybody has more questions or comments or but thank, thank you. you all very much. Um, any announcements uh, this morning?
Right. Again, Larry, thank you for coming to me. Uh, in the context of our bowl, <coughs> next week we're going to have two of our bugs, fellow <laughs> bugs, speaking, and it's called Dharma Duo. And uh, usually they come in and talk about their experience, how they get to GBS. So they're here today, so I'm going to introduce them. The first one is stand, sitting next in front of me, Gary Post. Can I raise your hand here? And then John McLeray over there. So come and hear about their experience being fellow bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Richard? Yes, I want to remind the song that we have an account at Community Thrift, which is at 473 Valencia at 17. It's painted various shades of peptidismal paint. You can't miss it. Um, they accept donations every day between 9 and 5. You should check their website to see what they do and don't take. But last quarter, we made almost $400, and it's a great way to support the Sangha. And so if you have anything that you no longer need or want to be passing along, it's a great place to do it. We have a host. Um, My name is Tage, and I'm your host. There's some uh, treats to enjoy after, and uh, there's also hot water for tea. Um, after you're done with your tea, if you can rinse your mug in some hot, soapy water in the kitchen, that'd be great. I'm going to be walking around with the Donna Bowl. The suggested donation is 5 to $7. Um, there's a sign-up list on the credenza. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter, either through now or email. And then finally, there's a group that gets together that goes to lunch at 12.30, usually meet by the door. If you're interested in doing that, that's where they are. Okay, folks, uh, uh, now it's uh, our custom to, uh, to do the dedication of merit. Uh, uh, and, uh, By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion and live believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.